Good evening, everybody. Welcome. We are live from Books and Books right here in the cultural heart of Coral Gables. My name is Steve. I'm the manager here at the store on behalf of everyone. Welcome. We're so glad to have you with us. Please go to our website, booksandbooks.com. That'll give you all the information of all the events we have here at the store every night of the week. We have Spanish events. We have kids events. We have poetry readings, first-time authors, and uh, celebrity signings. A couple of notes um, I would like to mention on uh, Thursday. We have a former Secretary of State, former First Lady, former Senator from New York, first woman to walk on the moon. Uh, Hillary Clinton will be here. We have tickets on sale for that. We also have tickets on sale for Martin Amos, which will be, he will be here on October 26th. So make sure you see us at the counter when you're buying your book tonight to get tickets for that as well. There's always an event here for everyone's taste, and uh, many of them are now being live streamed through the uh, internet, as you can see by the lights and cameras throughout the store. And I will just give everybody a warning that we do have some cameras pointed at the audience for the Q&A section later on in the event. So just make sure for the benefit of those who may be watching on the internet that you're sitting next to who you're supposed to be sitting next to. I also remind you that uh, flash photography is forbidden because uh, it interferes with the live stream, so please refrain from doing that. But again, I encourage you to go to our site. Uh, you can give us your email. We can send you blasts for everything so you don't miss a thing. Uh, and if you do decide to watch these events via the internet, you can always call the store uh, at the number on the screen, and you can uh, ask an event of the author while the event is in progress, or you can even uh, order a book signed, and we'll ship it to you for no charge for shipping here in the U.S. But tonight, we are very pleased to welcome Chef Francis Malman and his new cookbook, Malman on Fire. But to officially introduce the chef is our chef, a fixture here in Miami, owner and operator of several other restaurants over the years, and head chef at Books and Books, and former White House pastry chef. Please welcome er, Mr. Irving Fields. All I did was taste the pastry, please. <laughs> Anyhow, we're very happy this evening to have one of my heroes, Chef Francis Malman. He is the reigning star of food television in the Spanish-speaking world and now getting accepted all over the world. He's the most popular and famous chef in South America. His first book, Seven Fires, Grilling the Argentinian Way, introduced readers to the flavors of traditional live fire cooking. We wanted to do a big fire in the courtyard this evening, but I think Coral Gables objected to it. <laughs> he, has res he has three restaurants, one in Mendoza, the Argentina in the Argentina's wine country. We have some fabulous wines this evening, courtesy of the chef. Another is in La Boca, neighborhood of Buenos Aires, and the third in the picturesque village of Garzón in Uruguay. Today, and the Times, the United Kingdom, have named his restaurants amongst the top 10 places to eat in the world. One of my favorite quotes about the chef, he thinks big, lives large, and his food at once rustic and elegant is filled with joy. Ladies and gentlemen, Chef Malman. Oh, that's good. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I'm very honored to be here in this palace of books. I, I always thought that words are one of the most biggest treasures we can have because they, I think they sort of get better with age and they take no space and they're always with us. Mm -hmm. So being in a bookstore as this one where besides the business you feel this true romance with books, for me it's a, it's a big honor. So we're here today to talk about my new book, but before I get into it, I would like to say a few words of, about our lifestyle in Argentina. Um, the world has changed a lot in the last 15 years, uh, and I really believe that we are becoming more and more comfortable creatures where we have our good jobs, a comfortable car, home, friends, and so on. And we seem to take less and less adventures in life. And I think that's very important. I was lucky enough to be raised in a town in Patagonia called Bariloche, where we spent most of our day outside, at school and at home. And the truth is that the, those souvenirs of my childhood are the biggest tool I've had in my life for work, for happiness, and for adversity as well. And I see that we're 
sort of growing our children more and more inside, sitting in computers far away from the cooking stove and other beautiful things we can do. And it makes me sad because I think that we have to let them out. It's a beautiful language in the wilderness. And if we can't go to the wilderness, even in the parks or by the seaside, as you have here. So what I've been doing to do these last 10 years through my books and through my TV shows is to sort of take a torch of lifestyle into my audience and to make them think that it's not so difficult to grab a basket and put a couple of things in it and go and have a picnic. And if you think a bit bigger, you know, why not take a little portable grill or a chapa and if you have a permit, do a fire somewhere. It's quite difficult in America. Uh, and, and cook something. Because I think that uh, remembering that in the following week, in the following months, is, is always something that brings us happiness. And that not only makes us happy, but increases our knowledge of how we work and how, what we do with our life. So my message in this new book, as in the last ones, the last three I did, is a bit that. Let's get out of our chairs and go outside and do something different. So the language, I started cooking in Bariloche when I was about 18 in a tiny restaurant. And then when I was around 20, I, I had a couple of cookbooks then in that little town. And one was the La Rue's Gastronomique, that's still on the shelves of many homes and libraries. And I had as well Mastering the Art of French Cooking by Julia Child and Simon Beck. I was lucky enough to cook for Julia 20 years ago here in Miami for an event I did for her. She was a wonderful lady and she did so much for the culture of America. And reading this book, books being very young, it made me dream and think that there were some pots and pans and herbs and meats and fish and wines and things that I could, that I didn't know. And I started thinking that I had to go to France. So I moved to France. I did a first trip there and then a second one and then a third and then I stayed for quite a while and I was lucky enough to work in the late 70s and early 80s with some of the best chefs, three-star chefs in France. I worked with eight, for eight of them. France was generous and rigorous with me <laughs> uh, in a very nice way, and I keep, I keep her in my heart forever. And even though nowadays I cook with fires, and it seems so far away from French cooking, uh, I can read in everything I do those roots of my French learnings, which were very, very important. And when I, I'm 58 now, and when I was sort of 40, I realized that I had achieved a lot. I had been working for 20 years in, in a cooking stove. I had had many restaurants on my own as a consultant working for others. But I realized that I didn't really have a language of my own. And, and so I thought, well, you know, what should I do? I've traveled around the world. I've cooked everywhere, or not, not everywhere, but in many places. I've learned so much. So I just went down to my feet and I looked at the tools and my roots of Patagonia and I started studying a bit the native cookings of Argentina, especially the ones of the Andes. Some of them of the rainforests that are in the boundaries of Brazil and Paraguay, which we call uh, La Mesopotamia in Argentina, some of the Pampas. And looking as well as the inf of the influence that fire had in the immigrations of the Spanish, of the French, of the English and so on. So as America, and most of America, we are sort of a mix of so many influences. I mixed all that up and I started very slowly, it took many years, uh, developing all these old, I didn't invent anything really, I just took you know, things that I found on the road from my childhood and from learnings, all the tools and the ways of cooking that all these things had influenced in our country. So you see the little hell, which is an ad adaptation of the ways the Inca cooked in the Andes, 
in between two stones. I do it in, two, in between two irons. Uh, you see the rescoldo, which is cooking with old ashes or new ashes. It's very beautiful. It's very slowly. It's, uh, it's what we do is we keep the ashes from the, all the cookouts in a, in a barrel, and then we mix them up with whole coals, and there we sort of bury vegetables, even a trout that is wrapped in, in a clay. And things cook very slowly to get this very beautiful smoky flavor, and it's called rescoldo. Then we have pit cooking, which is cooking in a pit with hot stones, which was something that the Indians of southern Patagonia did a lot. Basically what they did was in the morning they would make a pit, a big fire, <coughs> heat some rocks, put in a guanaco or a vestruz, which is like an ostrich or a, you know, a llama, the local llama from down there, or any sort of animals they had, and sort of bury it on top of the very hot rocks, wrapped in nalca leaves. Nalca is a beautiful plant we have in Patagonia in the, in the Valdivian forest that is, you know, they're very big, some of them, twice my size. So they wrapped the food with that. They covered it with earth again. They would sort of disguise the place they had it. And the incredible thing is that they, they had a day of hunting and working outside and came back at night after eight or ten hours to a hot meal that would last until next morning and so on. And it was a go very good way of cooking while they were out and nobody could find it because if you do it well, you don't see a trace of smoke coming out of it. The only thing you can feel if you touch the, the, the ground after four or five hours is that it's slightly warm. So that was a way of cooking while hiding, which I think was great. That's what I think. I don't know why they did it, but <laughs> uh, that's what I would do. And the nice thing about this curanto thing, technique, is that there are traces of curantos that are 12,000 years old. A bit like in America, all our natives were sort of killed by, you know, our militaries and different forces and different times of our history. And sadly, there are not many of them left. But we still have many tools to make more research on it, and we're working on it to understand Mao more how they lived and how they cooked, which is quite beautiful. Then we have the wood oven, which uh, is very important in all our country, but especially in the north in the provinces of Mendoza, La Rioja, San Juan, Tucumán, Salta, Jujuy. Uh, all these provinces have a very big uh, way of living besides a wood oven, you know. So the way they do it is that they, they do it with mud, with hay, and with horse manure. It sounds quite not very nice, but it, it works very well because if you, don't, if you do it only with bricks, the bricks and the cement, they don't expand. So hay and manure goes tight and loose. It goes very tight when it's hot, and it goes loose again when it's cold, and it, they last longer. And the way they cook with those wood ovens is by heating them up very, very <coughs> fast and very hot with small sticks, dry sticks, not very, you know, sort of branches. And then they clean it, they brush it out with a fresh branch of a tree until there's nothing left inside it. It's very hot and then they put something in to cook. First the empanadas obviously that they cook literally in 60 seconds. They go so like that and it's beautiful because they, they get very hot. They get these sort of black uh, balloons on them and it's a perfect way to cooking them. And then you know later on maybe they will do a, a piece of small bread and when it's sort of cooling down at night <coughs> they will put in a, a whole casserole of a goat or of a, what we call a chamfaina um, and, and leave it overnight to cook. So the beauty about fire is that I think that if s for someone to start cooking with fire, the first thing you have to do before cooking is just to light a fire, sit in a chair, and watch it go down. And that's very important because you realize <coughs> through all the stages the fire goes through. You have the huge flames, big heat, then you have the beautiful coals, and finally the ashes. And in the three stages, 
There are beautiful different things you can cook with it. We use big flames to cook in a hot plancha. We use the coals to grill and to bury our food in. And then the ashes as well when they are slightly warm <coughs> to cook small things like a, almost a soft boiled egg, which is delicious. So there is this idea in the whole world that <coughs> fire is a very manly thing. And I think it's not quite right. I think there's a, there's a huge fragility in cooking. It's a very tender thing. And it's a, it's a very beautiful silent language that takes many, many years to learn. Um, and so it's not a brutal thing, as we think, you know, that we burn a fire we, and we, we, we just cook something fast. Yes, you can do that. It can be delicious, but there's much more to it. And the beauty of it is thinking as the natives of Patagonia did with the curanto was in which ways you can use that fire for many hours doing different things. Once you built a fire and you're burning the wood, you know, why not have a grill and then cook something in the ashes and, you know, do something in the plancha and then at the end maybe bury some beautiful breads inside the coals and let them cook for two or three hours and, and they have this incredible beautiful taste. Uh, ashes are quite healthy. I mean, I, I can't tell you you have to go and eat a bucket of ashes, but <laughs> if, you, if you cook a bread on coals and they're slightly covered with a little bit of ashes, it's quite delicious, and I can't imagine why it can hurt you. So I think that's something very nice to do. So if we think about fire, what I really like is that, you know, is that, for example, I love cooking with big planchas, as big as that table there. And we cut a very thick iron a, of about half an inch or almost an inch. And we put legs on it. And the beautiful thing is that if this is my plancha here, and I put a fire on this edge here, a small fire, I will have in this part, on top of the fire, a very hot plancha to you know, cook very fast um, a steak, a thin steak or a um, scallop or some shrimp, some thing, small, and things thing, small and thin things. And then in this part here, which is quite warm too, but not as piping hot as that part, you can be smashing potatoes and doing a beautiful crust with them on one side with a little bit of butter for three hours or two hours. And then on the other edge, you can be, which is lukewarm. It's a very good temperature, for example, for do a pancake or to grill a little piece of cake, or some fruits, and so on. So, and that's a beautiful thing about a fire, that you can use all these different temperatures at the same time to make a whole menu. Not only the steak or the burger, but you can go into doing very different things. So, uh, that's what I really like about fires. This new book, which is called On Fire, uh, it's about a sort of a, some travels, dreams I had in the last many years. I lived in France an, a long time, and some years ago, three years ago, I decided to go to Paris with my fires. It took us a very long time to get the permits, but we got permits to cook around the street in all the places that I loved when I was young and I was cooking there. So I constructed myself this chariot, beautiful cha chariot in the north of the country, in the town of Cachi, in Salta, which was done by all the craftsmen of the town. It's a tiny, beautiful town, very high in the Andes. And so I had the bicycle guy who put the wheels on. I had the craftsman from the leather who did all the sides of the chariot. The chariot opened up in three sides. And there I put all my gear, and I took it to Paris. And I walked around the streets with my chariot, going to the markets, buying all the beautiful products they have, and I took my ways of cooking into the streets. And I went as well to most of the restaurants where I worked when I was young, and I just knocked the door with no, uh, with no uh, letting them know beforehand. And I just said, you know, I worked here 30 years ago. Can I walk in with my chariot? And they would say, no, you can't. <laughs> but some of them were quite nice, and we had fun, and we cooked in the doors, and we talked with the chefs. Everything has changed so much. But anyway. It was for me a tribute to fire, 
to the north of our country with that chariot. I only cooked in Paris with all the clay pots from, from the north of Argentina. And I took textiles and I took, you know, our thought and our way of cooking to that beautiful country that taught me so much. So one chapter of the, of the book is about that. Another chapter of the book is in America, basically in New York, cooking in the streets, in New York, in Brooklyn, and then in this beautiful town in California called Bolinas, which is sort of a hippie town where all the organic food movement started 40 years ago. There they have most of the farms that started doing organic vegetables and fruits and it, that was a tribute to them. Besides, it's the most incredible town hanging on the Pacific Ocean. And the nice thing about it is that they try to keep tourists away like me. And so every time that the sort of the city of Bolinas put a sign saying 10 miles to, to Bolinas, somebody at night goes and takes it away. And they've been doing <laughs> this for, for 50 years. There's never a sign, but now they have GPS, so they're, they're in trouble. Uh, but anyway, that was very nice, and there are many recipes and photographs done with the vegetables and the beautiful products of Bolinas. Then we went to Trancoso in the north of Brazil, where I have a restaurant uh, near Bahia in a tiny town, which was the place where the Portuguese landed at the end of 1400s uh, for the first time. And there's this beautiful chapel on a cliff over the sea. And it's a tiny town that has all these, probably a hundred tiny colonial houses, very old, and it has been very well kept. Uh, so you can't touch a wall or a window or anything from any of the houses. And uh, cars and motorcycles are not allowed, are banned from the town. So you just can walk, have a horse or a bicycle. And to take your goods in the morning, you're allowed to drive your car if you own a house until 9 a.m. And from 8 to 9, you can drive in and take furniture, whatever you do. But so it's a beautiful place. I've been there for three years, and I learned so much about the, the, the products of the north of Brazil, all the incredible fruits they have that uh, are very different of everything we know, and the incredible fish they have from the Atlantic Ocean and from the fresh waters of the rivers. There's another chapter in Uruguay, in Garzón, which is sort of a little ghost town near the Atlantic Sea where I have a little hotel and restaurant that I love very much. I've had it for 10 years. And there, obviously, too, we, you know, we have a very good relationship with all the producers of vegetables, we have incredible lamb and very good fish from all the nearby fishermen, as well as shellfish. There's another part of the book, which is in the Atlantic coast of Patagonia, which is quite untouched and very wild and remote. And what I did there is I did a TV series two or three years ago too, where I, I constructed this sort of movable hut that you will see in the, in the book, which was my sort of my shelter during a month. And we moved it around the coast. So we would put it up in the morning, sleep there for a couple of nights, cook, with all the local products and then put it down in a truck and take it to another place, even to some islands around there. So that was a TV series and there's a lot of that. And the beauty of that part is, well, first the geographical, incredible uh, beauty of the Atlantic Ocean and as well all the incredible fishes that I even didn't know we had. One, one which is very elegant with white meat, which is called escrofalo, which is a quite horrible name. <laughs> difficult to catch. It looks horrible, but it's delicious. Um, and then we have a chapter in, in an island I have in, in Patagonia, in a lake quite remote to very near the border with Chile in the Bolivian forest. And there, obviously, we have all the trouts and, you know, all the, the beautiful products of that area. So this book is a journey through places I love, you know. I... I like to work in places where I lived that I know so I can talk about them without studying them. You know, sometimes my TV producer says, oh, Francis, we want you to go to, I don't know, to Vietnam to do 10 shows. And I say, well, I've been in Vietnam a couple of times. It's beautiful, but I, I, I don't know 
Vietnam. I can't talk about Vietnam, and I don't want to study to talk and recite as a you know as a little as a uh, raven. So um, this book is about that. You know, it's about places uh, I love, I know that I, and uh, it takes all these techniques on a sort of a small portable. Obviously, in some parts there are big, huge fires that we did, but mainly it's done on a small grill that travels with me that changes in shape. Sometimes it has a plancha a grill. It can become a little hell, an infiernillo, where we cook between two fires. And mainly it's about traveling around all these places and cooking different recipes, new recipes, with um, the products of the area. It has a new technique that started a year and a half ago, which is hanging things on top of a fire. That is something that I, I really like and that I've been doing in the last few weeks here a lot in America and different places. And what we do is we do very simple domes with rib wire uh, that we just put in the grass like this. And we do a fire, a circle fire around it. And with strings, we hang a beautiful fish on a bed of bamboo, you know, so it's flat. We, ha we hang whole, whole uh, chicken. Uh, we hang, you know, gigots of lamb or ribeyes on the bone that we cook for 12 hours. And again, going about, again, to what I said at the beginning, the fragility of fire is that if you cook a ribeye that it's, you know, a ribeye that it's about, let's say, 12 pounds on the bone, and you hang it at this height, and you round it with fire, not on the bottom, so you don't get the direct heat, but all of you make like a circle of fire around it. The heat goes up like that, and it cooks it, cooks it very, very slowly. And what happens with that, with that muscle is that it stays pink or slightly red, all of it. You don't have different temperatures because of the length of the cooking. So maybe at the end we look for a crust outside by going down a little bit, but what happens inside is after 12 hours, when you cut it, it's extremely moist and juicy. And this happens with a chicken too and with a fish. And, 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 and that's the beauty of cooking uh, slow things. And that's why I talk about the sort of womanly side of, of fire and the tenderness and the fragility of it. Once you learn it, there's so many, many things you can do. So this book called On Fire uh, is about that. It's, it's going on with this path of and language of fires. And I feel, you know, that truly I didn't change anything in the world of cooking with fires. I just took part of our background and I adapted some things. And the beautiful thing is that there's so much more to do still, you know. I think that it's sort of a, even the, it's a, such a primal thing in the history of man cooking with fires. There's so much more to learn and to adapt to new techniques and ways of cooking. And I think that in this fast world we live in, as I said at the beginning, we have to try to go back in time and go and take some adventures to the edge of uncertainty, which is very healthy for all of us, you know, to go look down and say, well, maybe if I fall there, uh, I can get hurt. But I think we need to do that in our lives. I think we need to adventure ourselves a bit more and live a better life. So uh, that's what I, say, I have to say about this book, and I'm ready to answer questions if somebody has some. I do. At home, I am the one who grills. It's not the, you know, the usual Argentinian thing that the guy grills is me. And uh, what I miss the most is, you know, our grills where you can go up and down and you yes. can regulate and all that. Here you have to make do with a gas grill many times. Any particular tip regarding that? Well, <laughs> gas grills. Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> gas grills can work. You know, yeah. you have beautiful charcoal in America. You have a Weber, which is a great thing. You know. I like Weber's, you know, it's a, you can adapt it to our way of cooking. What I do is, if you want to cook with the Weber's, you have two Weber's. One to make the fire and to give charcoal constantly to your grill so you can cook slowly, and the other one where you cook. So that's good. And, you know, I know it's difficult to cook in the floor here in the garden. You want to bur burn all that beautiful grass you have at the homes, <laughs> but 
uh, maybe what, what, we, what you can do as well is if you want to have a, a, a really good grill is have just sort of a, a big piece of iron and a couple of, you know, eight bricks down mm -hmm. so you're on top of the grass, like about this height. You will never burn it because the, the heat goes up. Mm -hmm. And then on top of that, you can have a beautiful grill. And then you just dismantle it when you finish and keep it somewhere and, you know, I don't yeah, know. The big plan is to have a real Argentina grill in the house. So well, that's coming in a couple of years. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Okay. okay. Other questions? Yes. You spoke so movingly about how these, um, you know, uh, original cooking methods of Argentina, uh, you know, affected you. But could you also speak about, you know, how your time in France and, you know, what you learned, how that has also kind of influenced where you're at today? Yes. Well, it, it influenced me a lot. Uh, I went to France in in a moment of a great revolution in the late 70s when there were some chefs who were talking about la nouvelle cuisine, which was the new way of cooking. That started in 1950 with a chef called Fernand Point, who had a restaurant in a little town near Lyon called Vienne, like the Austrian country, but it's in France. And he had a restaurant there called La Pyramide. He was an incredible man. I never met him because the restaurant closed when he w died in 1968. And I was 12 then. I wasn't thinking about cooking yet. But what he did was quite incredible because he started saying that the most important thing in cooking was products. And he became such a, a great name in the world of France, he still is, you know, in the history of France, that all the young chefs from nearby villages and faraway cities from France wanted to learn with him. So there was a group of about 14 of them who worked with them because at that time, if you wanted to be a cook, you started at sort of 14. You would go as an apprenti, which was, you know, sort of a stagiaire, so you had to learn. So, you know, at 14, 16, 18, then you, you would become a commis de cuisine, which is sort of a something, not much. And then you will become a, a chef de partie, which is quite important already, because the cooking of France is, is divided in six different parts. You have the garmanger, who is a man who deals with the fish, the meat, and the poultry. You have the entremetier, who is a man who does all the vegetables and the soups. You have the saucier, who does the sauces. You have the rotisseur, who does the grill. And you have the, well, the pâtissier, who does who all, all the pastries and the boulanger who was, who was of bread. So these 12 boys, there's a beautiful book called, a, it's called a La Cuisine C'est beaucoup plus que des recettes, who was written in 1970. These 12 boys in the mid 70s, all the 12 of them became the 12 best three stars chefs of France. And they all came from that same home, from that same kitchen. So when I arrived to France in the late 70s and early 80s, these eight gu 12 guys were already up there, you know, they were the best chefs. And they, some of them were doing very classic cuisine and some of them were doing very modern cuisine. So La Nouvelle Cuisine was a bit controversial, as is today molecular cuisine, that are people who love it and people who don't. Uh, and I was... You know, I was lucky enough to work with many of them. But over the years, when I look back, obviously I was very impressed by the new way of cooking as a young boy, as everybody is. You know, you love the new. But when I look back nowadays, I feel that what most touched me and rooted inside of me is the, the cooking, the classic cooking of France. You know, it was there in the restaurants in the, of the classic cooking where I most learned and I think that those tools are still very, very deep inside of me. And even, you know, I don't do a blanket de veau or a bouillabaisse. A France is very present in my cooking, even with the fires. Yeah. Any other questions? Well, yeah, I may have another. My two daughters are vegetarians, so I'm learning, you know, new ways to roast veggies yeah. on the grill. So. I don't know. I do have my methods, oil and olive oil and stuff like that. I don't know. There's something else you can add to well, the world of directly on the fire. Or the world of vegetable, vegetables is incredible. 
vegetables and roots. Uh, I'm quite tempted of doing my next book about vegetables and roots. You're welcome. Yeah. Um, <laughs> because you have, again, you know, you have the way in which you cook an a eggplant for four hours very slowly until it's a, a mash and you, you know, serve it up with tomatoes or whatever, or you have a raw root that you can fit in the paper and you work with it with a salad. So, you know, there are many, many ways. Grilling slowly, I love. I love to cook vegetables in ashes. Try that. Mm -hmm. Not very practical, but, one you know, day. one day you can try. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, but the, the, the taste and the, 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 the consistency you get with a sweet potato or a pumpkin mm -hmm. or an onion or a fennel, you know, it's incredible when you just bury it in ashes, mix up with coals. It's beautiful. So that's things you can do. And the raw part is, is fantastic too, you know, cooking raw, raw things. Okay. Well, that was, it's very nice that you came. Thank you. I'm very honored. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the talks. And I think now we have a bite there. Who did all that beautiful yes. cooking? Did you do that? Actually, uh, some of that came from your book. Yes. We have, we have some nice uh, endives that are filled with goat cheese, a little orange, uh -huh. and, and uh, it's uh, toasted uh, walnuts. And another one is some uh, red botanist pears, which you suggested grilling. We wrapped it a little prosciutto and grilled it again. Oh, that's from the new so, book. Very uh, good. And there's lots of wine, so enjoy. Yeah, it. I want to thank. Bo obviously, books and books, and as well, Bodega Garzón from Uruguay, who sent happily some cases of, of wines for us to drink. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Chef. Also, uh, we do have the books, but you've got to buy those. You can eat for free and drink for free, but you've got to buy them. They're for sale at the counter, and Chef will sign it for you right here. Thanks, everybody, for coming. If you're watching online, give us a call. We'll get one signed for you. Thank you.